So we'll start off what, with what is a scoping review? Um, so this presentation builds on the presentation that I gave last month. Um, where I talked about many different types of knowledge synthesis. Um, and it was great to review the feedback from the participants from last month who said, you know, it'd be really wonderful to learn more details about the top, you know, four or five uh, types of knowledge synthesis and actually how to do them. Um, so your feedback has been answered in that today we'll be talking about um, scoping reviews and how we can do those here. So in terms of our definition, um, we use the one that was produced by uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, or CIHR, and they define a scoping review as an exploratory project that can be done to systematically map literature on a topic. It can be used to identify key concepts, theories, sources of evidence, as well as gaps in the research. And in terms of why would we want to do a scoping review, the seminal paper on scoping reviews was produced by um, Drs. Arxie and O'Malley in 2005. And in their seminal paper where they introduced this method, they said that a scoping review can be done to examine the extent, range, and nature, nature of available research. It can be done to determine the value of undertaking a full systematic review as well as to summarize and disseminate uh, research findings across a body of research evidence and identify research gaps in the literature. So these were the top uh, reasons why Arsene O'Malley um, thought that a scoping review would be useful and why they actually um, introduced this emerging method. So we conducted a scoping review of scoping reviews, which was published in 2016. Um, and we included 494 scoping reviews from the literature. Um, most of these had a focus on health. And what we found was that the, the major reason that um, the authors mentioned that they need, needed to do a scoping review was to explore the breadth or extent of the evidence. So this was mentioned in 68% of the 494 scoping reviews. So in our work with knowledge users, um, we've been told that the scoping review is useful because it does help them with some working definitions, as well as some conceptual boundaries of a topic. So it's particularly helpful when um, it's an emerging literature um, or an emerging field. Perhaps it hasn't been comprehensively reviewed, or perhaps your topic is very large, complex, or heterogeneous. Um, so this really helps uh, our knowledge user have a, an, a quick idea of what the literature base looks like. And in terms of a couple of examples of reviews that we've done, so we uh, published a scoping review on the barriers and facilitators to uptake of systematic reviews by policymakers and healthcare managers. And this was published last year in Implementation Science. So we were looking at um, items such as the format and content, and we wanted to develop recommendations for authors. Um, and we found that when you're preparing a systematic review, a one-page summary with your key messages that are tailored to your relevant audience is actually particularly helpful. And we also found that the creation of partnerships between researchers and policymakers or managers can help facilitate the conduct and use of reviews and will enhance the relevance as well as increase uptake. And the results of our scoping review was used to inform a one-page policy brief that is currently being used by CIHR. So we established a format for this policy brief and the content that needed to be included and the layout and the level of English that it should be written in. And this is now being used uh, by CIHR. We recently uh, completed a scoping review on the use of social media and crowdsourced data for pharmacovigilance. So we were aiming to characterize the literature on social media to see if we can detect adverse events related to health products. 
And we found some really encouraging results. So it does seem that uh, social media, so um, from databases such as Facebook and Twitter and other social media um, sources, it can actually be used to supplement data from regulatory agency databases and can be used to capture rare harms and can also uh, capture these harms or identify them earlier than official alerts. Um, however, the utility validation and implementation of these databases still remains understudied. So, so definitely calls for some further validation work here. Um, and in terms of impact, the scoping review was commissioned by Health Canada, which is the regulatory agency here in Canada. Um, and they are considering the development of a social media platform. Uh, so if they proceed, they will use the results of our scoping review to help develop this platform. Another scoping review that we conducted was on medical malpractice policies and obstetrics. So we were looking at if we could find documents evaluating or comparing the effectiveness of medical liability reforms to improve litigation related outcomes with a focus in obstetrics. Um, and we found that only a few policies were evaluated or compared. And um, we also noticed that the initiatives um, that we identified could actually reduce medical malpractice litigation, which can in turn be associated with a decrease in adverse events. Um, however, there were very heterogeneous settings and reported outcomes. So the initiative, the effectiveness of the initiatives may actually vary by setting. Um, and in terms of impact, this was actually used to inform a litigation policy strategies in South Africa. So I've given you a little bit of flavor of um, different types of scoping reviews and, and commissioners and how they've been used to answer some of their questions. Um, I would like to now uh, turn it over to my colleague, Kafayat, um, to provide an example of a scoping review that they have currently uh, conducted or are currently working on. <laughs> 